All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Word with Ty Brownlow. I am your host, Ty Brownlow, and remember, no one is worthless, no story is worthless. Today, ladies and gentlemen, y'all already know how I do. We taking it all the way out to the left coast, the best coast, all the way out here to Cali, Newport Beach, as a matter of fact. Man, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the one, the only, Bishop. <laughs> Man, it's a pleasure to be here, my friend. Man, look here. The pleasure is all ours, man. Look, welcome, welcome, welcome to the platform. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Ty. I was watching a few of your videos this week, so thank you again for just even giving me your time to chat with you. Oh, man, it's all good. And look here, man. Look here. We appreciate that over here. Where we're talking around a little, you know what I'm saying? You know, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look at But no. We pride ourselves on informative content. And, you know, I've said that, you know, several times and um, it doesn't matter what space we're talking in, whether it's like professional or non-professional, which I still feel is professional because you're getting a per person's, you know, point of view. Yeah. And, um, you know, like we just really like try to provide people with the best scenario possible from all angles. Most yeah. definitely. So if you think like a professional, well, then we'll provide an angle from that end. But if you just want the everyday, you know, angle or whatever, we'll provide from that end as well. For sure. All right. So, man, getting into it. Ladies and gentlemen, so we just sitting here talking, but let me just give y'all a little background on my man Bishop here. Singer, songwriter, producer, you know, man, he does it all. We, man, he does it all, does it all, does it all. Just recently dropped a single called Overdrive. And as a matter of fact, uh, later on this summer, I believe, um, later on this summer, he's going to drop a um, EP or album called Hold On, I'm Still Driving. Am I correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. All right. So we're going to get into all that. Yeah. Plus more. But y'all know how I do. You know, anytime we have a artiste in the truest form, Oh, we finna get down and dirty. We finna start from the beginning, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So, man, before we even jump into what you have going on currently, let's just, like, bring people up to speed of who Bishop is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, your background, you know, not somewhat traditional, but a few people have walked this path before going the gospel um, route. And, you know, then crossing over and, you know, going into the more modern version of music. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your, like, humble beginnings? Yeah, Ty. Um, so I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was born and raised uh, in the church uh, as a family church. And that's where I learned about uh, singing, about calling, about purpose, uh, about music and my love for music. Uh, my parents did a pretty good job at raising me in general. Uh, I thank God for just good parents. Uh, and my dad wanted me to have the versatilities of life. He knew that there was a calling on my life, but in the, in the Christian sense, but he also wanted me to be a kid, you know, so he put me in baseball, put me in football, tennis, all the stuff, bowling. We had a big bowling family. Uh, so I did all the things growing up. Uh, and then they put me in the Cincinnati Boy Choir. I'll never forget, probably around eight years old, they were driving me to this camp in the summer. And I had no idea what this camp was about. My dad had an old GMC Jimmy. It was all black. I sat in the back of it. I was just hyped to be it as a kid in the back of it. And I could pull up at this random camp. I see all these white kids running around. I'm going, what in the hell am I here? <laughs> like, what? why am I here? Uh, soon to learn that this was a uh, boy choir uh, camp. And so immediately I spent a week there learning about how to read music, how to do ear training, all those things. And I sang the boy choir. I was classically trained for three years until my voice started changing, of course. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. when you kicked out. Uh, but then also I took voice lessons from a very prestigious uh, voice trainer. Uh, who has passed away, her name is Shannon Belcher. Um, and she was my incredible teacher that helped me to really blend what it did mean to take the classical and fuse it with gospel. I started singing in church and uh, doing jazz band in high school and traveling with the jazz band. We did tours all throughout Puerto Rico. We, we were everywhere, throughout the States, everything. We had Branson, Missouri. So I got a sense like, oh, I want to do this for a living. I want to do music for a living. 
I love gospel music. I love traveling. I love singing. I, but I also had just a love for music overall. I went to a predominantly white high school as well, a private school. And that's where I learned about Coldplay and different bands like that. So I was getting that influence on this side, Coldplay, Chili Peppers, all this stuff over here. And then I was going to church and I'm hearing Clark Sisters, Fred Hammond, John P. Key. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Kirk Franklin, Yolanda Adams, Donnie, just so all those worlds were constantly in my brain. Um, and that was just my like my world. My world was just this heavy, just mixture, this melting pot of music. And so I made a decision early on. I was like, I want to do music full time. Started making my own stuff. I put my first record out at 17 years old. I had a G4 uh, Mac MacBook. A friend that gave it to me from school. I recorded the entire record on that right on that computer. Uh, it was very immature, but yet we got it done. I had just had a determination I was going to do something, you know. Um, but yeah, over time, just man, I, I would say God just blessed me. I got into bigger circles over and over and over. And so uh, that's my history. I grew up just around great people, around great music, and uh, just had a lot of influences that make me uh, the man I am today. Well, look, first of all, first and foremost, you know, that is very fascinating, you know, and shout out to. Mrs. Belcher, I believe, is yep, that Belcher. You yep, Shannon man. Belcher. Man, Shannon Belcher, rest in peace. Shout out, you know, to you for instilling your gift, you know, within this young man to, you know, be who he is today and, you know, eventually evolve to who he will become tomorrow as well, you know. So I want to talk a little bit about that, mm -hmm. you know, everything you just said, the upbringing and everything, because, um, I'm just going to keep it real, you know. Um, I talk about everything being a science. Everything's a science, okay? Mm -hmm. Music, even music's a science, okay? Mm -hmm. Certain sounds, certain melodies, you know. And for you, you know, learning and being classically trained. And as you said, hey, you know what? You pull up to this camp, all these white boys, like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> This ain't baseball, you know what I'm saying? This ain't what we've been doing. Like, why are we here? You know right. what I'm saying? Like, we if what? No, right. no, no. Wait, I, no, man. No. Right, exactly. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, um, those types of like instances or those types of situations make who you are today because right. now you know what to listen for. You right. know what certain melodies do. You know what certain octaves do. You know, hey, you know what? Okay, man, if I bring this high in here, man, what am I coming under with? Okay, mm -hmm. so am I gonna like, you know, go over here with it or am I just gonna run a flat straight through? Like, I mean, I don't know. I don't right. know. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's the whole thing about in there. And for those of you who are like, well, what the hell are you talking about? We're talking about music, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking mm -hmm. about science. Okay, because if you're really making something of substance, it doesn't sound like anything that you're currently hearing. Mm -hmm. you know? So in listening to Overdrive, and I'm just gonna put it out there, he has another single y'all called Blame, all right? I was listening to it. I'm telling you now, for all my dang funk people out there, you know, <laughs> especially he out there on the West Coast, man, <laughs> I mean, it ain't quite dang funk, but it puts you in that tronic mood. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, hey, bro, I'm trying to, like, I'm sitting there and, anyway, okay. We gonna get into all that. We gonna get into all that. See, man, see, man, come on, bro. You got me jumping all over the stuff. Come on, man. All right, so, but no. Um, but to be a student of the game, to be a student of music, you yeah. know, to be classically trained, and to now, as you said, 17 years old, you put your first album out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah. when was the aha moment? Like, okay, now I know, yeah, 17 years old. I mean, I'm going to put it out. But before then, it's like, mm -mm, no, you know what? I got it. I got it. I sort of figured it out. Yeah. When did that happen? To be honest with you, it's funny. I kind of always knew, but um, 
and many people will feel certain ways about this but this is just my life it's what happened at three years old uh my parents that took me to church and there was this night like they had like a revival night there's a speaker in town from the bahamas and she said bring that baby up on stage i was dancing in the aisles they said um and she gave them a prophetic word about my life she said this baby is special that he would be a worshiper and a god that he would do all these things and um my parents really they did such a good job at really protecting my mind early on i really had like just an enamor for one music but also just the seriousness of what it meant to like be a musician in church and um I remember going to baseball practice at 11 years old and I used to walk the tracks and then I would have to go a couple of streets to get to the baseball field. Uh, but you had to pass the church to get uh, to the baseball field. So it was literally the tracks, the church, and then the field was a couple of streets over. So as I'm walking, uh, I felt this inclination, go to the church. Wednesday nights they had choir rehearsal. I walked on stage. I told my aunt who was leading at the time, I want to sing praise and worship. And she looked at me like you do, I said, yeah. And I wasn't going nowhere. Like I stood there. So it was a big uproar. You know how black church is. Oh <laughs> yeah, like, come on now. Like, yeah. hey boy, come on. <laughs> the politics of the smallest things can be, you know, which I understand the kid comes to adult choir rehearsal was like, we can't. If we do that for him, then what are we gonna do for the other kids? We gotta do it right. We gotta do it for everybody else. But right. right. But but he's here. He showed okay. up. Right. And uh somehow it started happening to where like i got to be a part of leading the congregation every week as a child so when i say leading a congregation i think the church was close to like five to six maybe 700 people total overall um through those course of years from 11 till 18 years old i was a big part of just singing on sunday mornings and um i think in my head that was like what I seen, and there was one time, I'll never forget this, I was on MySpace, anybody that remembers MySpace, you know, um, yeah. and the YouTube videos, people could post YouTube videos on their MySpace page. So Ty was, why I was on there and I came across this one video, it's a heavy set lady singing, and it was two ladies behind her, or, or next to her. She was in a pink dress, so I clicked play, and they sang a song called, Is My Living In Vain? And when I heard it, I said, oh my god i just and then I, I looked at the one lady and i said i think i've seen her before and it was karen clark sheard i had seen her before because of that finally karen record which was huge and her daughter is like all this stuff i had seen dorinda before so i put that together but i was like who is the lady in the middle i want to know who that is and man i clicked on that video and that was my first youtube video that took me on a whole thing of I found out who Twinkie Clark was. And something in my brain went, as I started reading articles, started typing stuff in Google, something in my brain went, I want to be like her. Because although the other ones were great, she had such a, a, she had an ability. She played organ, she was classical, she had songs with Michael McDonald. She was talking about how she wrote the song uh, Sunshine, and it was off of the influence of Stevie Wonder. So I started listening to Stevie Wonder after I hear Twinkie say, I'm like, Twinkie listen to Stevie? I'm listening to Stevie. Who is Mike McDonald? Oh, the Doobie Brothers? I went, I went to a Doobie Brothers concert at, in Cincinnati. You know, it's like, I'm trying to figure out why is she so great? And I want to be great like her because that just blew my mind i became a big twinkie fan then i started realizing twinkie went to school with marvin and the winans and fred hammond and vanessa armstrong and so that just really just started taking me down this trap path of like i want to do this because it seems like every time she walks into the room it gets quiet and it stops so for me that was the big pool and it led me to go like you hear stories about when she was a child and she's doing this as a kid i'm like oh she was a kid and i could do this as a kid you know so i would say like reality it was what i was surrounded by and what i seen it just created this seriousness starting at a young age all the way up to my you know to going to college where i knew this is what i was going to do and you couldn't tell me any otherwise you know that's very fascinating and i, I mean I'm gonna say it, people, you know, I mean, prodigy. Yeah. <laughs> Just gonna say it. I mean, y'all might not want me to say certain words like <laughs> prodigy. I mean, he did mention a certain artist, Steveland. You yeah. know, I'm just going to call him by his government name, Steveland. Right. Yeah, you know, 
Yes, um, Mr. Steven um, Wonder over there, you know, Stevie, oh, you, know, you know, that don't know who the hell it is I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, no, like, I mean, and I think you somewhat understand what I'm saying when I ask this question. So I'm going to present this question. Okay. Knowing music and knowing what you bring to any entity pertaining music and so forth, you know what I'm saying? But we're just going to stay with music here. Mm -hmm. What do you feel your responsibility is as an artist? Mm. Uh, there's a couple. I think one is to always be authentic to you and my responsibility in that is to always do what feels natural to me as an artist. Um, and that all incorporates how I was raised, what I listen to, and what I'm experiencing now. The authenticity and the experience is always key because we all are a makeup of, of what we are put into, the environments we are in. And so sometimes many people throw that away based off of the bad experiences, but yet still those experiences make you who you are. Um, I would say definitely also in writing, being authentic to what's happening in your life and being honest and being able to really surround yourself. This is my last one uh, to make sure that you realize that you can get nothing done without community. I think it's so important. Like community has made me the man who I am today. It, it literally has shaped me. Like I have these, we all have these innate abilities, right? We have these abilities to create, to write whatsoever, but it takes people around us to pull it out of us, to show us the potential of where it can go. Um, and so when it comes to my writing ability, the music that I've created, on the inside, I had the idea, but it took people around me to go, to help shape it, to help shape my lyrical content, to make sure that it was breathing better, saying the things it needs to say. Uh, instead of just saying, I love you, uh, my buddy pushes back me all the time. Well, what does love make you feel? It makes me uh, like, what are words it does? Well, love makes me feel like I'm at home. Okay, well, instead of saying I love you, let's say love makes me feel like I'm at home instead. Like, let's push to the next level. Let's not settle to just say these normal things that we would normally say. And so we have these innate abilities. And I think for me, it's just been important to understand what it means to be authentically myself, to always be honest and to always invite community into what I'm making. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three great attributes, you know, yeah. and um, I'm going to say this, and I told you this before, you know, I probably said it off camera and I'm going to say it on camera again. You know, you have a distinct sound. Wow. You know, and I know you're like fusion. I'm, well, it's like the fusion of like different worlds. You got your gospel world, you got your modern world, you got the different classically trained, you know, parts of it. And, you know, you're just making this big goulash of like <laughs> harmony. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, but hey, I'm, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And, yeah. My certain chefs out there understand what I'm saying. But, I mean, but you're making a big goulash over here. You know what I'm saying? So you just got everything going. Um, being that your sound is different, what what are the positives and sometimes negatives of having a sound that's different? Man, well. I'll start with the negatives because I believe it leads to the positive. The negatives are people don't understand what they want until they experience it. And I find that many times we get so accustomed to what we hear on a normal basis that anything that sonically comes to our ears as different, if it's not a person who is like Beyonce or Drake or Coldplay, you know, people who we have loved for years, Stevie Wonder, people we've associated their sounds to be this. When they introduce something new, we're more trusting because we know them. But yet, we still take a while. For instance, this last Beyonce and Drake record, they went very house on this record. It was like house, 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 house. Right, right. It was like Afro beats. Drake was doing the big Latin American kind of vibe and Miami Beach kind of vibe. So everybody's vibing to that. It's like, ooh, but then you give me house. It's like, it's not something I'm familiar with. But 
as you sit with it for two or three days, it's like, ooh, that's got a that's got a vibe to it. And I think in general, creating something new, that's always the thing that's hard because people want what's next, but they don't want what's new. So they don't understand what new is. New and next are two different things, right? Come on, brother. Yeah. So I think for me, the positive about being new is I get to make something that no one's heard. And if I'm authentically being myself, if I'm always leaning into that and not trying to duplicate who's already out there before, then I'm actually in a lane where no one can touch me at all. No one can touch me and I can't touch them. Like I can never be Beyonce, I can never be Drake, but Beyonce will never be me either. She'll never be Drake, you know what I'm saying? So that's that's kind of like the positive. And the positive with that is, if you really stick to that, no matter who's biting the bait, you stick to it long enough, it will give in. I was a, like I did it with gospel music for years. People told me, man, your songs suck. I don't like the way it sounds and like sonically, and I never could get it. Like maybe like my first five or six years of recording, man, people just didn't, they weren't with it. And then when I put out praises under my name, my government name, it was like, geez, this is it. Like I linked up with the right producer and that song hit hard and everything I put out after that under that name did really well. So again, it takes time for people to get accustomed, but it doesn't mean you change who you are and what you're doing. Kanye was a big example of that. People didn't know that they needed to hear that sound. Uh, Kendrick Lamar, Chance the Rapper, incorporating the live music and the more poetic tones. But the positivity in that is, one, you're learning and becoming who you're supposed to be, even in people resisting the newness. Um, and then over time, people start to sonically become accustomed to what they really need, you know? So I think that's that's the, the negative part of it is, it's hard to get people to engage with something new and it's discouraging when people don't bite the bait right away. I hate going fishing, I don't catch nothing all day. You know, it's like, God damn, it's like, I need to catch at least a little bluegill or something. So I I, uh, I feel like that's the big negative part, part of it. And also you doubting yourself, like, cause you're making something that you've never released to anyone and there's no blueprint, there's no, uh, no layout for it. There's nobody saying, this is how you do this. Um, there's only people out there to say, hey, I tried something different. And the only thing you can do is just stay with it. Um, the positive about it is I think in general, for me especially, I've seen more people be attracted to who I am as a person because they hear my music. And it, it makes them curious about who I am as an individual. And I love sharing about who I am and where I come from. Um, because it then it elevates and amplifies everything else around me as well. Uh, so that's I think that's the big positive. Then it creates a lane where it opens up a door for another young cat to come behind you and do their own thing. So uh, in a way, you're you're a pioneer, you're a trailblazer, and you're accepting all these cool adjectives that would actually um, elevate who you are as an individual. And there's always somebody out there that's going to love what you do. You just got to stick with it. Look at me. Well, informative content, people. Right. <laughs> I mean, it would be well. I mean, did I not say it from the beginning? You know, like this is informative content. You know, like we learn on many different levels. So, taking it from your perspective, from a person who's like been infused in this from inception, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you are music. Right. Like you are harmony. You are like you are an artist. Right. It's the truest form. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like taking something, creating a whole different like sonic scope. Yes. For yeah. people to listen to. Right. And yeah. as you said, you know, yeah, you know, it is hard to, you know, listen to something and you know, be like, oh, okay, either I'm gonna feel it or, you know, uh, and even the same could be done with artists. But I will tell you, you mentioned Kanye, you know, and for those who know me, you know, hey, I'm from Chicago. I'm a Kanye fan, you know yeah. what I'm saying? He's from Chicago. Yeah. But I'm also a music fan as well. And when he sort of switched up the boom bap for the 808 and heartbreak sound, you know, a lot of people, ah, oh, 
oh. But then when he took it a step further, you know, and he started giving you the gospel, like the Sunday choir, you know, yeah. in its like inception. Yeah. You know, some people felt it was too church. <laughs> you know, like, ah, oh, you know what? I don't like what this dude's become, you know, like bring back and you know you were always here bring back the old kanye right right yeah <laughs> you know and i mean i understand you know because as i mean look as a lover of music you know i have certain artists that i love the old style right the yeah. style i'm not saying it doesn't uh, it doesn't appeal to me you know i'm willing to listen but if you were to ask me which Nas would I rather listen to? Oh, I would rather listen to the 90s version of Nas <laughs> than the 2020 version of Nas. I think you we know? all and, I and, and, say that. <laughs> I, I mean, and that's not to say that the 2020 version of Nas sucks because I think the 2020 version of Nas lyrically is better than the oh, 90s version of Nas. 100%. Sonically, yeah. The 90s version of Nas puts yeah. me in a certain mood in a certain area that the 2020 version, I don't think is going to do that for. Right, yep. That's, I mean, that's the beauty about music tied to in general, especially like I would say another positive is from the consumer side, you get invited into this journey and that journey for a person as an artist is going to evolve it's going to go to different shades because they're experiencing different things at different times so i mean you look at jay jay-z like the time of his east coast stuff like you see him heavily surrounded by this group of people rockefeller crew and then you got also all the stuff with biggie and just all this stuff happening on east coast so, like that's you're you're engulfed by this sound but then as you keep going up and down and start experiencing different things and you marry a, a an icon and you're hearing what she's hearing and there was a um, there's an interview out there uh with uh kim burrell the gospel singer mm -hmm. and she said that uh before the 404 record 444 record came out she got a call from jay-z to come through and uh he said hey i can tell when my wife is going through something really spiritual because i just hear your music blasting throughout my house he said in this time like i don't she does i need you in this space and you hear a lot of gospel coming through this right like this is jay like this is hove and now 4044, you're hearing clock shutter samples and Kim Burrell samples on the record. And so, like, many people can say, you know, I like this old person. But as a consumer, we have to realize that our artists are just like us. And there was a season where we we didn't like onions on our hamburger. Now we like our, we like onions on our, you know, it's like we go, we go through these journeys, you know. And then as the artists, it's cool, too. I like what you said about digging into the to the music man i love music i love music i love how it makes me feel like this whole record that's coming out i'm sure we're gonna talk about it soon but just in general like i i remember driving during 2020 and i became a big pop fan in 2020 even more than what i was i was listening to choice of on 1975 i listened to all these like incredible pop like artists their writing it was like it hit me hard as i was really dealing with what I was walking through in my life, I would hear what they were saying. It's like, damn, I've been through that. I, I need to hear that. That's good. Like, so I ain't alone. But yet, also the musical journey that their records take you on. Then I'm a big 80s fan. So I would turn on Shaka through the fire. Like, you know, I got Prince rolling. I got <laughs> I got all the hits rolling, man. Like, I, I just I I love music. I love the lessons it teaches you and the writing, the writing styles, the musicality. I was listening to Human Nature the other day. But you're creating that kind of caliber music during that time without the software we have. I got Ableton right up in front of me right now. They got none of that, and they making. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they have plugins and stuff. Like these guys are. They're we have floppy disks, bro. Okay, yeah, man. They put some floppy disk in. You know. <laughs> like, so again, it just makes you go. 
you're if, if you are a real musician in any style if you dive into music in general it's impossible to get through all the music that's being created in the world but when you start engaging yourself in different styles and performance styles and musical taste and whatsoever it makes you different so that's going to automatically show up and it's going to change how this next record was from you know the one that happened in the 90s so um i think that's what we hear we hear artists engaging in different styles and being di taught different lessons and it's, it's showing through what they experience on their own time you know i'm going to say this man and i've said this before and you know to an artist um maybe like a week or two ago i was interviewing him but i'm gonna say it again and i think you're like pushing what i'm the point i i made at the time for a lot of people give the bet awards a lot of flat yeah and i mean if you're on the production side of things i understand it right i get it i mean the way it was presented you know if we're talking money or whatever i get it okay right. fine as an artist and me i mean i'm not an artist but as a person who just loves culture period in its essence especially yeah. music i saw the culture shift mm. this is the next way you yeah. sir are part of the next way yeah. okay and yeah. it's the sound that i mean okay case in point here and i'm gonna drop some scientific facts on people here okay yeah. so the median age of people in america right now is 38 years old okay mm -hmm. so i'm on the other side of 38 i'm not under i'm old okay mm -hmm. so think about a lot of the music that i grew up listening to you know is a lot of the music you grew up listening to you right. know when i was a teenager coming into my teen years and all through my teen years hip-hop was just start uh -huh. all right it was in its inception you know what i'm saying um well the boom bat version that is you know what i'm saying and a lot of stuff that was out when i was in high school maybe college is now considered some of the golden era of hip-hop so mm -hmm. when you walk into a grocery store sometimes you may hear a try called quest mm -hmm. when you're when you're sitting at an eatery or you may be out with some friends at a social setting listen to the music that's being played a lot of the time is hip-hop 90s hip-hop yeah okay. so if the median age is 38 and hip-hop from the 90s is being played in all of these places or what have you that's what these people have grown up on right that's, that's all they know right so now we're at a certain point where we're pushing that like the oldies like the old school like james brown marvin gay temptations and all that stuff that i will consider the oldies like smoky robinson and all that right those are the oldies my hip-hop is now pushing towards that trend uh -huh. a thousand percent you know what i'm saying it's yeah. pushing towards that i mean case in point you turn on your radio now Mm -hmm. You hear more 90s hip hop on the radio now than you heard back in the, well, I'm telling you, than what you heard back in the 90s. It's true. It's very All right? true. It's true. Because it's considered the nostalgia music now. Right. So yeah. the new wave are the bishops. Mm -hmm. Wow, man. <laughs> no, I mean, like, if you, let's just be a student of the game. Yeah. Let's just be a student of the game. What's pushing forward now? We need a new sound. You're talking about Beyonce. Great. Yeah. But you and I both know you can only stay at the top for so long, no matter who you are. Mariah Carey, I thought, man, I thought no one would ever push Mariah off that mountain. Right. <laughs> yeah. And in and, and I mean, and to no fault of her own, in Mariah's mind. She's still on the top of the mountain. Like, man, you ain't getting me up, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So we live in an age now, Dad. <laughs> you know, and that's not shots fired or whatever, but we just live in a totally different age. Someone will surpass Beyonce. There right. will be another. But yep. what but what would that sound? Yep, it's true, man. It's true. That's man, you you hearing it, man. I, I feel I feel that. I feel that. I've always been that way when it comes to and I don't think the ground is even giving way yet of what I'm making, but I think I got something special. Um, Kanye West used to, he used to aggravate me, but I got a different respect for him when I watched his documentary. Mm -hmm. And I think the first two episodes, it actually made me kind of like, I started going to therapy at the top of the year and I went and talked to my therapist about it after I watched it because it made me feel weird because I was like, I don't have that same tenacity or belief about myself about like i got the sound i got the next like get me in this door this dude was so adamant to i got what's next to his to a fault now i i think that it's like see me see me i'm here it's like well, dog we see you now you ain't gotta you ain't gotta scream about that no more i think jay-z calls it little brother syndrome in a way for him but <laughs> yeah. but all that to say but in the innate like the the drive he had the belief he had in himself and i'm i'm really coming into that ty like honestly i i know uh i grew up in church so they tell you to be humble but i think there's such a thing as false humility too and like i'm really trying to walk out like how do i make the best sounding thing especially to my ears and what's true to my ears and what's true to my ears if it don't sound like i heard it or seen it in my dream or envisioned it or when i first sang into my voice recorder on my phone when i it, then i gotta get it there because i know if i get it there like this is gonna fucking transform the entire world and so I, i'm at that space right now man and like um I, I i definitely feel what you're saying like sonically i feel like i do feel like i'm next i do feel like i'm next but i also feel like i'm new too like i, feel like I have something that no one's heard before and i, I just want to keep pushing that man <laughs> People scared, man. Mm. And that's just real. You know, like if we're really gonna talk about what what fear is yeah. on a broad level, fear can be motivating. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not gonna talk about the negative aspects of fear. We're gonna talk about what fear can actually do. Fear can raise your game, man. Thanks. Yeah. You yep. know what I'm saying? The fact that you, man, yo, hearing something that you've never heard before, but you know it moves you, scares the shit out of you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Scares the fuck out of you, man. It does. It does. Especially when it moves you. Yep. Because you can't explain. Right. Right. <laughs> you can't explain it. Yep. And we're not talking about church or gospel or any of that, ladies and gentlemen. We just really talking about like just on a sonic level. Yep. On a sonic level. If we're gonna go spiritual, we're gonna be sonically spiritual, ladies and gentlemen. Boom, you know what? Well, you know what? Go ahead, break that on the t-shirt. Sonically spiritual. Boy. At least spiritual. All right, boom. All right, boom. There you go. God damn, the marketing is working today. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, but, but but no, um, it scares you though. Yeah. You know, you have some, and, and and bro, I get it. I get it. When you are. Damn, you gonna make me give up my word. Uh, but uh, when you're like a star child, mm. and I'ma say it, a star child, what the hell is that? I mean, man, I called it a prodigy, but mm. in this instance, I'ma call it star child because like the stars fall and boom, it's like you come from the heavens and boom, you're here. You mm. get to make shit happen. You're the fucking star child. Sorry. Man. All right. So, you're here to make it happen. I, man, 
Listen to what the hell I was talking about before we even started this whole interview, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, I open up with, like, yeah. Like, what's that other song? Yeah, because that's the first song I heard before I heard Overdrive. Yeah. I heard Blaine, and then when I listened to it, I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> I know what I'm reading in the bio. Right. But what I'm reading in the bio and what I'm listening to, no, no. <laughs> I get it. But you can't describe this shit. Man, yeah. But it's beautiful. Thank I you, can man. tell you that. Man. It's beautiful. Thank and I know music. Mm. And I know when I hear something I ain't never heard before. Mm. And I know what I do hear on the daily. This sounds nothing. Man. Look, production wise, audio wise, it sounds nothing like the shit that I'm listening to or anyone else. Wow. So on that note, I only have one more question to ask and then we're going to get into what you got going on right now. Because, you know, man, we've been, you know, sitting up here rapping the taste. OK, <laughs> so look here. Uh, oh. I want to ask you a real quick question and, and don't feel rushed to give me a quick answer, but I've been asking this question and I'm real curious to hear your answer because you are a true creative in its purest form. Mm -hmm. The thought and the use of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. has been running rapid in many different areas, education, you know, mm -hmm. I know some of y'all got the, you know, chat G P D or papers or whatever. Write your dissertations. Right. Oh no, I'm kinda scared now to go on to certain doctors like, yeah, dog, like let me see your dissertation, man. Like <laughs> I don't know. Right. I don't know, bro. I don't know. But I mean, AI has been running rapid through a lot of different industries right now. Thanks. Musically, it's been running rapid. Um and I was brought to a discussion, um, I believe Timberland had, he went live a couple of weeks ago. And he, in a sense, he was talking about AI and he was speaking on, he wish he had the chance to do a song with Biggie. He never had the chance to do a song with Biggie. Uh -huh. So he goes in, presses a button and a whole Biggie verse comes out uh -huh. through AI. And it's real scary, you know, because, and that's not to say that Timberland wouldn't do anything to like hurt his name or whatever, because he's professional, but in the hands of someone who is not a professional, just looking to make a buck or two, you know? Mm. So I just want to ask you, like, what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence in the music industry? man this is a this is a tricky one i think overall because we just don't know yet how it's going to evolve it's going to get better it's going to get better they're going to be able to almost get almost get exactly uh a replica of what every human being is able to make and do all the way to the sense of like i know i typed i typed in when i first got the app uh write me a song on uh heartbreak and on the west coast and man that thing cranked out a song in less than like five seconds versus everything and as i read it i was like man that's something that that's something i would probably write <laughs> like it's something but then when you see like all of the stuff that people are doing now i think somebody released a song uh that had like it basically was posing to be drake but it really wasn't him and all this stuff and I think as good as they get, no matter how how direct or how lined up they get with, with the AI intelligence, it will never ever replace the actual being. And the hardship is, it's gonna be hard to tell. It's gonna be hard to tell, but there will be little things that will be the separation between a person and the AI and i think this forces us as creatives to go back to being good musicians and studiers of our craft 
because if you really dig in to who you are as a musician and artist and you're put next to your doppelganger and AI at some point in your life, that doppelganger ain't going to be able to make the pivots as a real musician and artist as you will be able to. And it will be close, but it won't be exactly directly on it. And I just think in general, we've all been created to be naturally inclined to do so many things in our lives. And no matter what kind of computer is, du is duplicating us, we'll never be able to to get it close to the actual human being. And so I I think that it could be used for good. I use it for the other day. I was, uh, hey, write me an email to all of my subscribers. And I needed to say this, 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 is this. So it wrote it out for me because I'm terrible with words and English and stuff and writing. So wrote it out for me. It got some things wrong. So I went in and tidied it up the way it needed to say. And it cut off about 25 minutes of my production of my time and my efficiency. So, you know, when you look at it like that, you start looking at how does this enable me to do better? Um, I'm, I, I don't have a problem with it, but I will encourage all musicians and artists don't use it to be lazy because it, it will show your ass as well when it's time to go live. It will definitely show, you know, or when you get the call to the studio to write a song, but you don't even know how to even put a phrase together. It's like, oh, you're just totaling yourself. You know, when you get called to the studio to make a production or do a production for someone because everybody's loving your production, we find out, oh, it's been that button you've been pushing this entire time. It ain't really been. <laughs> so, you know, right now we're in that stage where it's like, we don't have to, we need to learn how to use it, but also not to get lazy. Because if we get lazy, I'm afraid that that is why it will overtake all of our jobs and all of our opportunities and whatsoever because we're allowing ourselves to get in a place where we don't want to actually function as intelligent human beings um and so when the artistry sakes i think it's good i think it provides some some way some help and some assistance but it should never replace like who we are as entertainers for sure And that's that piece, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. that's what right. it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. All right, man. Okay, so look here. Let's talk about why we here, man. You know, because look, we been we can sit here and talk all day about music, man. Like okay. I am really vibing with what you are saying, and I believe we are there. Yeah. You know? Um, but let's talk about your single that you currently have out that just dropped not too long ago, maybe six days ago, um, called Overdrive. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Overdrive actually was a result of, uh, I kind of got fed up. It was one instance last year, um, that just kind of tipped me over. Uh, many people, uh, when it, especially in the way I came up, they try to decide what you're supposed to do with your life. They, they have this, this template. And especially in the church, you got to get married in order to do this. And you got to, you know, have the house and you got to go to school and do this and do this and do this. And when you do something totally opposite of that and what's foreign to people and the way that they did it immediately is wrong or you're doing something wrong. And they use a phrase like you need to do this. And it's like, I really don't have to do anything but stay black and what? <laughs> All right. You know what I'm saying? Come on now. Talk to him, brother. All right. But, you know, I'm mean, in all seriousness, like I got fed up. So um, I had bought this. I was at a at guitar center and they had this piano, this red piano behind me. Uh, and it was like 60 bucks. I was, I was like, OK, I'll take it. But it was a $300 uh, piano. I'll take it because it was out of box and everything. So I come home and I wrote on it. You say that I'm crazy and I'm out of my mind. Kind of have to agree because I know you're right. You're gonna hate me while I'm sipping my wine And I don't give a damn what you say tonight Cause I feel alright When I wrote that I was like I had the beat going I had this dope like synth sound that's on this board It's the only synth sound that's actually good on it And I was like I vibe to this I vibe to it and it really expressed like Many people think I'm crazy man I got a lot of friends who did it the traditional way They did And I've worked on many staffs at churches and 
uh, they would hire me as like an artist in residence or as an associate. And I was always the edgy person, the person on staff that was always like, that's the cousin pastor. That's the one that travels, you know, everybody kind of just knew, like, if you leave him alone, but he gets it done how we need to get him done. Sing a good song, come in here, get lit, you know, and just don't tip nobody over the edge. It's cool. Don't don't take nobody to the bar from the church. Nothing like that. We all right. So, you know, I, I fit my role in those spaces, but I also didn't fit. I just never did. Um, and so just to write a song that totally uh, engulfs and encapsulates everything that I felt regarding what people's expectations about my life were. And maybe you're right. Like, may maybe. Maybe you see it exactly how it needs to happen. Maybe God showed you some amazing thing, gave you a word about my life that I just don't see yet and that he hasn't shown me. I don't know, but I'm not about to sit here and continue to live under the microscope of what other people have destined for my life. So um, I wrote that and then I, I teamed up with a homie last year who I met my label we run these like uh these like creative concerts are called untapped so we did our untapped last summer and he comes in with a friend from Cincinnati and said hey my name is Tyler I said my name is Darius nice to meet you man I go where are you from oh Cincinnati Ohio I said no you ain't Cincinnati ain't that big I know I'm from Cincinnati but how do I not know you uh but he came down from LA just to get like he had just moved to California so I showed him Orange County why it's better than living in LA sometimes and so <laughs> and uh we got to the house any songs you're working on I showed him that line I just sang for you this dude took my Mac computer that's sitting in front of me got on Ableton and made a demo of the entire song right there in about 40 minutes and it sounded pretty similar to what you hear on he just took that demo home and kind of made it bigger added some different drum components to give me my 80s feels all this stuff right. but this dude tyler redman mark my words this dude is one of the next producers you will see on everybody's record especially in the pop world he is amazing man so he did that song for me and um it's just my anthem right now. I'm trying to get everybody just to be encouraged to just live your life and do what you feel like you need to do and don't worry about the expectations of others. Hey, man, I love it, man. You know, and, um, you know, I just did a show. As a matter of fact, I just made a post um, earlier today um, of someone I had on the show and they were talking about breaking generational curses and, you know, finding finding your purpose, not in trauma, but in positivity. Yeah. How you don't need traumatic experiences to help you shape your purpose. You can shape your purpose. <laughs> yeah, you don't, right. And to go back to what you were saying, how people, and, and you know, I'm just gonna call it spade a spade. Um, you know, a lot of my people are from the South. You know, mm -hmm. mom and dad, you know, they have traditions of how things should be done and how, you know, um, life should be or what have you. Um, and growing up, you know, you sort of have to like deal with it in a sense, you know, because you have a roof over your head and you have a food, you have food at the table, you have clothes on your back and they're providing for you. But as you go through life, you start to see things a little bit different than what others are saying at home because what they're saying at home doesn't translate to what you're seeing in your day to day. Right. You know, so at some point, you as an individual have to make a choice. Mm hmm your choice is well okay either i'm going to really see what's really out here and like you know try to like growth you know a little bit higher or i could just sit back in the cut and remain at this level and you know don't even think of you know don't even consider about you know trying to see what else is out there because you know what it's just too tough right yeah you know what I'm saying? I use the analogy a lot about a rose trying to grow through hard soil. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes people's attitudes and beliefs, that's the hard soil. Yeah. 
And you know, for all my people out there, country people, whatever, if you a farmer or you just love to be in the garden, if you know how hard soil can be, man, it, like it can be tough to like dig up. It can be tough to break up. And then sometimes when you do break it up, that top layer of soil may not be fertile. Right. It's true. So you got to get rid of that. Right. Because the fertile soil is underneath. Right. And you got to till it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So for you, you know, man, you're that rose growing underneath, you know, that hard soil. And man, you're being tilled by the people around you that support what it is that you're doing. Yeah. You're blossoming into that rose. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, man, brother, like I get it. I understand. And you're making music to make, I mean, look, everything you just said, that's relatable. People go through that. Right. You know, and if they hear that message in the music, yeah. yeah. And this is something, man, there's a message in the music. It sounds like something that's not out here that I feel is going to start the next wave. Man, yeah. Yeah. It's going to start the next one. I mean, eventually, at some point, it has to start. So, look, let's just really talk about it for a second, man. You know, um, I don't use the word alternative because I can't, I don't see it as alternative. It's not pop. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, it, hell, it's not EDM or any of that other. Like, it's its own entity. You know what I'm saying? It's like that it's futuristic it's that tronic sound you know what i'm saying that like <laughs> i mean i only feel what's coming through mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying i can't describe to you what's coming through i can only feel yeah and that's how this music makes me you know yeah. you know act or what have you. you know i can only feel the sound you right know? If you want me to describe this, I cannot describe it. This is, yeah, yeah. This is not weighty. This is beyond weighty. Wow, man. Yeah. So, what else can I do? You know what I'm saying? I can only tell you how I feel when the when the sound comes on. And I mean, come on, bro. Like that's futuristic, bro. That it is. There is no box. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's good space. Yeah. <laughs> for you to grow. Yeah. And, I mean, man. So look, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. <laughs> um, you have an album, you have an EP coming out. Hold on, I'm still driving. Like, yeah. tell us a little bit about that. How many tracks are we getting on that? Yeah, so Hold On I'm Still Driving is a total of LP of seven tracks all together. Um, and it'll take you through the entire journey of what I experienced through 2021. Um, all or 2020 all the way up to the end of 2021. Uh, so you're going to hear about some heartbreak. You're going to hear about some mental stuff. You're going to hear some stories that were about stories I encountered through friends that I was a part of on the outside. Uh, it's got a little bit of musical stuff every, as far as the journey. It just kind of goes like, oh, my God. You want, If you're a big 80s fan, you're going to love it. If you're a big pop fan, you're going to love it. If you like R&B, you're going to love it. If you like alternative, you're going to love it. It's something on there for everybody that's going to make you go crazy. The last two tracks on the record are called Hold On, I'm Still Driving, uh, part one and part two. But at the end of them, they say something different. So the first one is Hold On, I'm Still Driving to Breathe song. Uh, and that is the story of uh, two friends of mine and a little love debacle they had. But it's totally... When you hear it, you're like, oh, you're hearing Shaka, you're hearing Prince, you're hearing that uh, that computer love kind of vibe from uh, Zap, you know, Zap and Roger. Mm -hmm. So you're like, hearing that Dropping vibe. All, yeah, come on now. Yeah, so it's it's got that. But man, it's it's the music I always wanted to make. It's the music I always wanted to make and it's saying what I wanted to say at the time. And I thought when I was done, man, that with the record, that I would never be able to make anything like this ever again. I'm back in the studio. I'm working on following up that project four weeks later with something brand new um, that is even like 
more forward is what you're saying is forward so but this one specifically has my heart i'm going to actually put out one more single uh from now until august 11th as well called love me and that single is featuring my two sisters that i started singing with uh coming up they were part of my music career forever so for them to be on the launch of a new you know Ooh. new time and season it feels good and it's got it's got like a it's a prince 1975 kind of vibe okay. it's real edgy in that way real heavy guitar driven but it feels good man mm, brother hey, the prodigy y'all okay black <laughs> prodigy that's all i'm saying i mean i didn't told y'all okay yeah, man. <laughs> but yeah. So look, man, if people want to find you on social media, they want to follow you, they want to go to your website, they want to hear music, how can they do so? Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you want to find all the things in one, you don't have to look, just put solo.t forward slash Bishop's World, or you can just actually just find me on Instagram as Bishop's World underscore, Bishop's World on Facebook underscore, Bishop's World on YouTube as well, to just keep it simple. Uh, but we say, or on Twitch, I do live stream on Twitch as well. I go live, I just perform originals or covers from some of my favorite singers. You can find me on Twitch as well, under Bishop's World. And Bishop's World is just like, it's my world and I have a saying saying like everybody that comes in you'll be all right here just basically that everybody comes in and create the own world you want to live in and you are you're all right with me hey man look here vicious world thread I mean, <laughs> you know I mean I don't know y'all find a correlation you know I, <laughs> but you know I'm just saying man yeah. y'all come on be yourself Man, take your shoe. Well, some of y'all might not want to take y'all shoes off, but yeah, oh. you know, <laughs> just chill. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Just chill. Just chill. Yeah. So some of y'all keep y'all shoes off. Yeah. <laughs> keep them on, man. Please keep them on. And some of y'all women too. Put yeah. Because I'm toes and toes. Oh, all right. I'm just saying. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just black around here sometimes. Yeah, bro. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, but no, brother, look here, man. I I have come to the last question. Um, I just let me say I have enjoyed this conversation. Dirt man, dirt black guys, man, for real, black for real. And uh, I've come to the last question, but this is the question that my show's known for. But I would love to hear your answer, Bishop. Yes, sir. What is the one word that best describes you and why? Man, the one word that best describes me, uh, I would say blueprint. Blueprint is my word, man. It's my word. Um, and I feel like I'm, I'm building houses that don't exist yet. And so, that that's always been my thing i want to build i want to pioneer i want to pave ways for people and for myself for my kids kids my nephew and my niece uh shout out to them uh my brothers like i just i feel like i'm a blueprint man i want to do things that haven't been done yet and i'm not really satisfied even within my own self until i break ground for something new and fresh um so yeah i would say blueprint is it's what you would hear is the word that describes me the most. Hey man, look, okay. Uh, I didn't gave you prodigy. I didn't gave you star child. <laughs> just real simple, man. Driver, okay? Cause he's leading the way. Yeah, man. How the hell the rest of y'all gonna get there if there's no driver? Y'all right. know where y'all going. <laughs> That's right. That's right, man. Y'all don't know where the hell y'all going. Where they going? You need somebody to lead the way. Okay. So sit back, watch, and follow. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I'll take that responsibility. I'm I'm in for it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, no, I didn't say chauffeur. I didn't say none of that. I said driver. Okay. Right. Like it can mean more than just one thing, you know, like lugging something around. Like, no, I'm going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going somewhere. I'm not saying we, <laughs> I'm going somewhere. Okay. I'm on this journey. Yeah. And I'm going to get there. 
Mm -hmm. And the people and the things that I see and meet along the way, man, I will take that into consideration when I get to this destiny. Thanks. So, man, look here. I didn't have my Obama speech. I'm done. Uh, <laughs> on that note, ladies and gentlemen, man, no, before that, let me just say, brother, once again, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Seriously, man, I have enjoyed this. This has been a real good, cool conversation, man. I, man, I am thankful for you coming onto the platform. Bro. Man, thank you. Thank you. This is actually, it was great. And thank you for what you do for so many of us. Just creating a platform we all can share about who we are. So I appreciate you having me on time. No problem. No problem, both man. And on that note, this has been Word with Ty Brownlow. I've been your host, Ty Brownlow. Remember, no one is worthless. No story is worthless. You can follow me all social media platforms, even threads, <laughs> at Word with Ty Brownlow. <laughs> or you can go to my website, tybrownlow.com. Get this wonderful conversation, plus other great conversations as well. Brother Bishop, we out. Peace out. Peace.